thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, not only not only SciSoft, but also um, quite a few more coming in, but also the Science and Policy Exchange for the University and the Cambridge Social uh, Social Impact and Sustainability Society. Um, we are incredibly delighted to be hosting Professor Simon Spooner uh, tonight. He has 25 years of experience um, in the UK and China uh, dealing with water and environmental management and climate change and that kind of thing. Um, works for Atkins, uh, UK's largest technical consultancy. Um, he splits his time between the UK and China. Um, and we're really lucky to have him on tonight. But before we get going, just a couple of things. Can we make sure we have all our uh, microphones muted and our cameras off? Um, there'll be a chance to, you can turn those back on if you want to ask questions at the end, basically. Um, so yes, very happy to have you here, Professor Spooner, and uh, looking forward to your talk. Well, uh, thank you, Krishna. Um, it's, it's great to be here. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for a chance to um, sort of develop and put forward uh, this presentation, which is um, it, it's very much on an, on an idea which I've uh, developed myself over the last year or so. Um, it arises from all the work that I've done in consultancy and science and, and that sort of thing. But it's, um, it's, it's more of a personal point of view rather than a sort of research uh, outcome. So um, what this is really about is, uh, is that looking at some different ways of responding to the climate ch uh, crisis uh, that we have uh, and the urgent need to transition to a more sustainable society. And if we want to do that, we really need to look at the causes of the problems and of the problem and the solutions. Hold on. I have got that horrible. It is me. My computer suddenly decided it wants to restart. That would be a disaster. Um, and I don't think I can stop it. This may, that may cause me a problem at some point. Uh, inevitable problems of having a company laptop which has restart prop issues. Um, so we'll, we, I may disappear at some point suddenly and I don't think there's anything I can do about it. Sorry. Um, anyway, I was, as I was saying, um, proposing uh, a different approach to um, sustainable uh, to addressing the uh, climate crisis so there's an alternative to low carbon and sort of carbon accounting approaches um, and this is really based on the idea that a, a sustainable society will be a post-combustion society just a strange expression um, but I'll try and explain that um, so basically, my observation is that life has evolved on Earth and it's created the environment in which we humans thrive. Our sudden global climate crisis has been caused not by carbon or greenhouse gas emissions as such, but by our overexploiting the process of combustion. And combustion is a process that only arises because of life and it represents the destruction of what life processes have given us. Now, this, this may seem like a strange statement, yeah, but when you think about it, uh, there's some truth to it. Because only living processes actually separate the elements into an unstable equilibrium between plants with carbon and organic matter and oxygen in the atmosphere. When the first dried out plant material was struck by lightning and caught fire, burning in the oxygen-rich atmosphere that photosynthesis has, had created, this was the first fire. Before that, volcanoes, lightning, even the sun itself, their heat and plasma, they're not fire or combustion. And only life can give rise to fire, and through fire and combustion comes the destruction of life's matter. And the process processes of life take a very, very long time 
to accumulate the fuel for such fires and even longer to create the conditions of, of oxygen in the atmosphere. But the combustion when it happens is really fast and it's a, it's a return to a chemical equilibrium and a death. So this is not some sort of Gaia hypothesis of a, of a living planet. This is just a simple observation really. And I only came to it last year because I was listening to a Radio 4 podcast. I think it was one of the 50 things ones on fire. And they made this point that before life, there would have been no fire, um, which I hadn't realized. But actually, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of looking at things. But anyway, it's been by harnessing fire that humans have um, been able to evolve and dominate the Earth. And all that we do is actually powered by fire. So cooking allow, allowed us to have uh, more energy from our food, a bigger brain and support time for our social life. Uh, we could use fire to clear the forests and become agricultural. The heat of fire was used to spread us into cold climates and live up in the Arctic and, and the like. But then with charcoal furnaces, then we could extract and forge metals. We could use the heat of combustion to make the bricks and cement that build and bind our own our urban environment. And the discovery of fossil fuels allowed us to utilize the energy laid down over hundreds of millions of years through all sorts of steps and stages in the evolution of life, some of which are no longer happening. And it was fossil fuel combustion that drove that industrial re rev revolution and created our modern industrial society. So combustion for heat and combustion for power drives our industrial processes, it heats our home, powers our travel. And as we plunder the great treasure that has been stored in the earth, so we release its curse because combustion is a life to death processes and the process and the products of combustion are poisonous and destructive from the smoke of indoor cooking fires to the particulates from internal combustion engines. You know, the, even the most efficient systems release harmful and insidious little particles. More challenging still are the greenhouse gas effect, effects. Um, at the, rate, uh, at the rate we are going, most of the fossilized fuel will be consumed in a generation, while our atmosphere simply doesn't have the capacity to absorb all, all of the gases uh, released without causing dramatic impact on our climate. And this can't continue because in our profligacy, we will run out of fuel and run out of atmosphere. So what are we going to do about it? Um, well, we've, we need or we've become addicted to so much energy and no one wants to go cold turkey and get, getting away from that. But there are alternatives. What can we do? Well, ultimately, the energy available to us is derived from nuclear processes, either fission in the earth or fusion in the sun. And this is what is then captured by life processes and stored. We now have a technology to capture some of that nuclear energy by solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal, as well as nuclear reactors and convert it directly to transferable heat and power by way of electrical potential. So rather than using the stored organic uh, fossil fuel. And the technology to generate non-combustion uh, electricity from these sources is available at low enough cost that is economically viable to make that transition in our energy supply. So non-combustion sources together with storage can provide all the power we need uh, to further our industrial systems, but, but not yet. <laughs> There's a long, long way to go to get there. Um, but that non-combustion future can actually offer us greater energy and in intensity and abundance uh, than our current fossil fuel system. And we, we need never run out of fuel or fill our atmosphere, our lungs, with harmful gases. So yeah, there's, there's a, a nice philosophy. There's some strange new terminology. There's some uh, sunny uplands uh, ideas. But how do these, this thinking about combustion, how does it help us to actually tackle climate change? How does it influence policy, planning, and engineering? Well, focusing on removing combustion from all of our systems it's actually a very powerful way of focusing on where to direct our efforts in this transition to a sustainable society. 
So how are we going to build this sustainable, this, this post-combustion society? It means not just looking at the energy supply and making it renewable or nuclear or lower carbon, but really looking at the energy demand, the demand side and making that combustion free. Because combustion processes are built into all of our infrastructure, in our transport, the engine of our car, in, in our buildings, the boilers that heat, heat them. We need to look at the combustion processes used to make the materials that make our buildings, our machines, and supply our energy. Now, the, the processes of cement, some making cement, steel, glass, fertilizers, and the extracting of oil and gas and processing it, these are all utilizing combustion uh, in their processes and all can be uh, replaced and substituted. But it's not going to happen overnight. There has to be a transition, a phasing out of combustion uh, and into non-combustion processes. And this is where we come to the, the phrase of combustion transition, you know, that working out how to make that happen. Um, and you know, this problem has been acknowledged and with, with a crisis, the climate crisis is all well acknowledged. They're getting political commitment. Things are happening. We've got our 2050 uh, net zero targets and the like. But what's the best way to organize ourselves and incentivize the investments and changes that are needed? Because it can be seen as a threat to the sort of status quo. Um, or as an opportunity to transition to a healthier, wealthier, and sustainable society. Um, so you know, we need to generate positive public attitudes um, and work out how to affect uh, the economic transformation. So carbon accounting has been developed and put forward as a way of quantifying the problems and planning responses. Carbon taxes, carbon trading can help to bring uh, economic instruments to bear on it and green financing instruments can support the measures. However, progress is not yet fast enough and there are great difficulties in getting all of that to work and to, folk, and to operate in all of the different sectors of industry and where they're required. So now I'm going to move into slightly more conventional uh, sort of uh, slide presentation although i am informed that in four minutes and 38 seconds my computer is going to restart so i which is very inconvenient but i'll carry on anyway so this is uh, looking at the um the sort of growth of energy and combustion you can see how quickly that has happened um this is our total energy use uh, more or less today 86% of that is derived from fossil fuels, 94 from combustion processes. Yeah? And that translates into the sort of greenhouse gases emissions and, and uh, th th that are causing such trouble. And you can see very, very heavily the energy side of that industry transport buildings, by far the biggest element of that. There's also a, a certain amount which is sort of goes into the losses uh, in the transformation. Um, because in fact, because of the way we, you know, when some of that is using electricity, some of our uh, combustion is used to make that electricity in the final consumption of, of energy, we're using about 85% direct combustion still. Um, and yes, so about 20% is actually a, a non-combustion proportion of that. And so if we want to look at how we're going to uh, address all of that, we need to consider how to uh, transition all of those other parts of the energy system uh, to be using non-combustion processes. So this is the UK's energy use over the last few years. The red lines are our electricity. Yeah? The blue line is our natural gas use. That goes up and down in winter with heating. And this grey line is, uh, this is our transport fuels, oil and things use, which is pretty, pretty steady. But I think it's clear that by far the biggest uh, con use is direct combustion. And we've got a big job to replace this. We need a massive increase in electricity to do that. 
And we also need to be able to keep cope with sudden peaks like this. This is uh, the March 8, 2018 beast from the east, sudden uh, um, cold and the huge spike in sort of energy use that, that that deals with, which our current electrical systems couldn't supply. So you know, this is a, a big challenge uh, to work out what we're going, how, how we're going to address this. So the principle that I'm coming up with is to use uh, this combustion transition analysis. So to look at the economy, the infrastructure, industrial processes from the perspective of combustion. Um, and I'll, I'll just start off with that, with a very uh, simple example. Um, you know, that this is, we have to look at material and energy and flows. Um, and we also have to look at this from the point of view um, of whole systems. Um, and also to understand that you know, what matters from, in, from our infrastructure is the service that it provides us. Uh, and we have to follow the whole energy trail all the way from the source of the energy to the fumes into the, into the atmosphere. So an example of that, of just looking at the combustion metrics and things, is, is if we take the idea of an electric car, which we're all familiar with something good. But an electric car might ultimately be coal, powered by coal. So how much, um, or how efficient is the process of conversion coal to electricity? Well, it's, it's about 40% you can get. You've got to distribute and store it, and then you can, you know, to run an electric car, you can then turn about 77% of it to movement. That's the sort of overall efficiency of an electric car powered by coal electricity. Whereas if you use those fossil fuels directly, you only get about 18%. So, you know, you're really, this is a very important part of the transition, and you can do a lot of greenhouse gas and uh, carbon accounting to work this out, but it gets really complicated really fast. So we need a simpler system, which is what I will be explaining to you next in combustion transition analysis, but I think my computer's going to stop in two seconds. Um, if it does, it does. What I've been uh, assessing is that, um, yeah, combustion, long way to go with it. And we've got to think about what we could do differently and how thinking about it helps. So these are the basic principles. This is the, the real uh, nub of the thing. So combustion is always a closed process, yeah? Um, you can account for what goes in, and what comes out. Also, it's in the combustion chamber that fossil fuel is realized for its economic value. That's where you actually realize the value. It's not getting it out of the ground that makes money. It's when you burn it in the combustion chamber. So that's where you need to focus your efforts at. Um, it's combustion that causes air pollution, greenhouse gas emission, and resource depletion, uh, as well as the combustion systems having very high health and safety risks and many social equity issues. There are lots of other aspects that you need to consider, not just the, the carbon impact. And these are the benefits of moving away from combustions. So fossil fuels are not the problem themselves, not until you burn them. And when you change the technology related to the combustion change, cha chamber, yeah, you move to a non-combustion process, you eliminate this at source. You're taking away the very source of the problem. But also you need to have a principle that it's each actor in the system, each owner of a combustion chain or user is only accountable for what they can manage. So don't get hung up on all of the upstream and downstream consequences. It's not to say they don't matter, but when you're trying to come up with mechanisms to change behavior, you know, focus at that point. So what we need to be doing is eliminating the combustion processes from infrastructure. Yeah, um, both in capital operation and the materials. So operation means the emissions during use. So design it out of your assets, tax the operation, you know, discourage the use of, 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 the, of the process. Also in the capital, that means what you actually build. So you need to incentivize the use of non-combustion si systems um, to get them in, to be installed. And you need to eliminate 
the combustion from the production of the materials that you build things from. Because remember, once you, you're in a non-combustion uh, situation, you're no longer um, limited in the materials that you can use. Um, and you're, you're better actually to address the embodied carbon issue at the point of production, not necessarily at consumption. Yeah, so ultimately you want to be able to use concrete, but not to have to burn lots of stuff to make it. If you're not burning things, if your steel is not made from, from combustion, um, then you can, it's not a problem to be using it. The other ele element is that you need to take a, a service approach to infrastructure. Um, so the infra it's the service that infrastructure provides that is of value to people. Uh, not the infrastructure itself and it's the it's the system the whole system of infrastructure and how it fits with everything that provides that service so for buildings you've got to think about the shelter the thermal comfort illumination and things that they provide for transport you know it's mobility moving people and, and goods around for land sustenance feeding us and providing ecosystem services for IT communications you have to be very careful though, because every change, it does ripple through the, through the systems. So although each combustion, pro you want to go for that closed combustion process, make people responsible for it, but do understand the consequences that the changes have through the system. There's a lot of um, sort of talk of movement, you know, we have to improve efficiency, um, but ultimately efficiency just makes the transition easier. So efficiency is not the end in itself. The end should be post-combustion, the removal of the combustion process. Because in a post-combustion society, you can actually be very high energy in intensity. Yeah, from a, from a uh, localized point of view, if you're heating your uh, house with a heat pump that's run by a solar panel and you leave the windows open, it doesn't actually have a big impact on the earth. It's wasteful and you, you, you're having to build more stuff, but you're not continuously causing the problem. Another aspect of this high energy is that a circular economy, um, a circular economy will actually be a much higher energy material, using our materials efficiently, recycling, not plundering the earth further. We need more energy because we're working against the basic uh, physics and chemistry uh, to separate things out. And another thing is that um, as we move, we can act, we're actually going to have to move towards higher energy agriculture because, and land use because we need to release much more land for biodiversity, ecosystem services, carbon sequestration. We're going to have to absorb a lot of that carbon as well. Um, and that means the remaining land, we've got to get more from it. But if we can get that energy without causing further greenhouse gas emissions, then we can take very high energy artificial lighting uh, approaches uh, to food production and then have the rest of land at, at a lower energy um, and, and, and more diverse. So another aspect of combustion transition analysis, it's about transition, yeah? So, you know, we can't just leap to the end goal. We have to work through in stages. Um, and with some of those stages, we, you can't get hung up on them not, not being perfect. So although we want to phase out combustion at every point, um, we should work back from the demand side um, and also consider resilience. You know, what's, where do we still need to have that combustion as a backup? Um, where, can we, where can we help uh, uh, maintain the resilience, but try and get the, the main load into non-combustion processes? It also doesn't have to cover everything. Um, you know, this is a useful guiding process, but there are lots of things which can be, you know, which don't quite come under it. So we also, what I've also been working on is the development of uh, combustion metrics and, and economic measures. So this works on a, on a sort of, there are also some sort of differences of thinking that when you've got non-combustion energy systems, these tend to be based on energy from infrastructure. So um, 
if you take a, uh, a a wind turbine, yeah, it's a lot of investment in the construction of it. The operation is relatively low cost. Likewise with a, a, a PV panel or a, a hydropower dam. They're expensive to build, but each each additional unit of energy is, is much cheaper or, or, or doesn't add much cost. Whereas combustion systems, fossil fuels, well, they're very operationally cost intensive. Actually, the kit is not as expensive, certainly not the, the power station and things, but you've got to keep paying for the fuel. Um, so that gives a very different economic model. And there are some sort of moral hazards around uh, the marginal cost of, of, of um, non-combustion energy, which you have to be quite careful of. So anyway, I was talking about developing combustion metrics. And the idea of this is coming up with systems for measuring this trans transition, measuring the use of, of combustion. Um, and the idea is to combine the energy flow So this means basically coming up with sort of compound metrics, ways of measuring things. So not just the, the, the equivalent CO2 emission, but, all, but to rate it by the total energy and then weight that energy by the efficiency with which a com any combustion process operates. So how much of the energy that goes in is turned into useful work and product. Also by how much uh, greenhouse gas emission there is, which depends on your fuel and your combustion process, and the amount of air pollution impact. And the way of measuring that is a measure there, possibly, which is dailies, which is daily uh, life-adjusted years. Um, so it's how how much um, the, that air pollution is damaging people's health and reducing life expectancy um, is actually a, a consequence of t combustion. And also resource to depletion what are you destroying in, in your use of the resources and there are a lot of uh, processes of natural capital accounting that can uh, pr help help with that and we can come up uh, with um, some metrics on this I think I'm still yes it's still working okay um, but I'll give some examples of how these have been applied so I set out this this principle and this approach, um, and yeah, it's sort of fairly new idea, but it has been applied uh, by Atkins um, to the Amman National Spatial Strategy. So this is a big project that we've had over the last year, which is basically developing a, a, a vision and a strategy for Amman as it moves towards 2040. Um, it's a spatial strategy, but it also has to include its uh, reaction to climate change. And this means looking at, you know, the energy use of Amman. Amman is a, a, a petrostate, um, very rapidly, only very recently developed. So really just this century has it, it been of, of any significant uh, sort of energy use and impact. Um, you can see what it uses the energy for and very heavy on fossil fuels, just a very small amount of uh, electrical energy used. But you can come up with a combustion or what i call a non-combustion metric for transition which is really saying well how much of that economy is from non-combustion processes looking at the demand side working back upwards so if you look at these are the sort of categories of an economy as listed by the uh, iea um, and how much is used in each, each sector so an injury industry you use a certain amount of of, of energy as, as fossil fuel and a certain amount as electricity. So you can say, well, 6% of that is taken as non-combustion. Um, it's mostly air conditioning there, which is electric. So most buildings are actually using electricity, very high non-combustion. Transport is very low, almost none. Um, and you can add all of that up and you end up with an estimate that 15% um, of the total energy use is non-combustion. You can then set targets you know for each sector to say how we can get you know and we can then plan how we would achieve those targets and build a plan on that basis so at the moment you're using uh 15 is non-combustion but only two percent of that electricity is actually produced by non-combustion target for 2040 get 60 percent of your electricity supply 
uh, non-combustion, whilst also moving the demand side to 60%, you know, away up from 15%. So these are big changes. And that's still only, you have to multiply and get in net, that's still only 36% non-combustion. You're still going to be burning a lot of stuff. It also, to put it into context, your electricity supply is going to have to increase from the current just over 100 terawatts hours a year to you know, 666, vast increase uh, in electricity supply. And you have to come up with a strategy for doing that. How do we go about that? Well, when developing policies, putting those forwards, you have to set up you know, the accounting methods. You've got to have that information to actually track this through all sectors of the society, of, of, the, of the economy. You've got to establish institutions. Uh, that are going to to actually manage this. Um, you can also in, improve your efficiency, um, but you can also reduce the emissions from the oil and gas production. This is a very interesting case of sort of non-combustion application. What you see in these pictures here um, is what's called glass point. This is where you have a thermal solar array inside a greenhouse, generates steam. This steam is used in huge quantities to pump down oil wells to remove oil, yeah, instead of burning gas to remove that oil. And taking a non-combustion approach, you want to eliminate combustion at every, at every stage. It's great. If you eliminate con combustion in your oil production system with using solar energy for your oil well, that is a win. You don't need, it's not your concern that you're going to produce oil which has all sorts of downstream problems. Oil will be produced, oil can be used for all sorts of products. You need to sort of separate that thinking a bit. Likewise, you have huge increases in the amount of desalination required for the development of the country. Big increases in energy. You need to produce that from renewable sources. And the whole nation needs to move towards sort of energy intensive approaches. Um, so within the policies, we were looking at you know, how you can develop that, how you can uh, start to make that tr transition. Um, so how you do these transitions sector by sector. Um, I would love to talk about all the ways of doing that, but there's other people have done that. The um, Energy Transition Commission have uh, published excellent work on how to move towards net zero. Uh, in Cambridge, you also have absolute zero from the engineering department, wonderful uh, ideas on how to transition transport and, and, and air, air, airplanes. So although we need to uh, consider all of those, in the context of this talk and combustion transition, we want to think about how do you influence the decisions that people are making. Um, and as time is going by, having lost a big chunk in the middle, I'm going to sort of rush through the last bit and then get to some questions and answers. Um, so what you need to focus on is, you know, who's using this combustion process, who's designing it, who's manufacturing it, who's buying and installing it, who's using it, um, and who's buying the products from it. And you need to develop economic instruments that focus uh, on the decisions that each of these people shall be making. Now you could do this by focusing on carbon, or you can do it um, on combustion. Um, and so we want to look at how you might do that based on combustion. And this is the concept of a combustion transition fund. So this is the idea of an economic instrument which is focused on how to incentivize the change to non-combustion technology. Now you would have versions of this for both the capital, for the, the equipment that's put in place, and for the oper operation, so sale and use points. Uh, the idea is principally that you would take a levy on each combustion process in proportion to the energy used. Um, you put that into a, a fund. Um, you make that fund sector specific. Sorry, is that, that, that process is the energy used and also the emissions and, and other weightings. You put that into a sector specific fund, which is managed by the industry itself. So if this is for the steel industry you know the consortium of steel uses it for shipping the international maritime organization and the like yeah that creates a fund which is available for those members to withdraw to then use for research and development into non-combustion alternatives this starts small yeah 
you start with a small levy that builds a fund that you can use for the R&D. Um, as it builds and increase year on year, you can also use elements of that, say, for efficiency improvements, emissions reductions, or, or even carbon capture in some areas where it's hard to, to actually eliminate combustion. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, as the alternatives come up, you would use the levies on the combustion systems to subsidize the substitution to, to non-combustion, so to ease that transition, get you over that barrier. Uh, it's a bit artificial, um, but I think that that's what needs to happen. So although you want this to be as much as, as far as possible under the um, management of the industry itself, so they, they design each fund because it will be different in every industrial sector, you do need government oversight. You may need, you know, seeding of these funds and oversight of the operation. You could operate it um, as locally as possible, ideally. Um, in some industries that work, work. In others, it has to be global. Aviation or something, these things have to go, go global or steel. But cement can be done very locally because it's, it's generally not traded. Um, and you can work out how to work it with, with other uh, subsidies. Um, and similar sort of things um, have been, you know, developed already uh, for it, by the maritime and shipping to have a transition to lower carbon. They, they take a levy on the fuels to get to low sulfur and ultimately to low carbon shipping. Uh, it's the way that is going. So what are the barriers to this sort of approach? Well, many, many people would see it as just another tax. It's adding more red tape. No, it's just getting in the way. Um, how do we overcome that? Well, we've got to have clear messaging to demonstrate that this is the route to net zero, that you're engaging in this combustion transition. For the energy majors, the Shells, the BPs, the Exxon, might be quite attractive to them because it shifts the focus from the product to the use of the product, which is really where the pressure should be. It's not actually the oil companies that are uh, um, co the cause of the problem, it's the use of their product in combustion chambers. You can also build supply chain foot pull. If manufacturers can sell their products made from low, zero combustion materials, then they're not as limited in the quantities and carbon budgets. And these metrics, these systems maybe can help with sustainable finance and development of, of different economic measures. So, as uh, we come to the end here. I'll just summarize where, where we got to. We started off quite philosophical, fire coming from life, you know, combustion being, being the power behind our, our, our industry, that we're using up hundreds of millions of years of treasure. Um, and um, you know, our, our atmosphere only has so much capacity to, to burn that fuel. It's not, we're not gonna run out of the fuel, we're gonna run out of atmosphere. And we're doing that in the space of little more than one generation. I mean, one more and we'll, we'll, we'll really have lost it. So we need to have ways of focusing this, yeah? So simplifying, focusing on closed process, identify responsibility, try and keep that on what people can actually control. Because, you know, there are problems when you're trying to do carbon offsetting in a rainforest the other side of the world or something, you know, there's, there's not a clear responsibility. And this, I think, can help focus that responsibility. We can develop these metrics. Um, at first, they quantify what ends up as a daunting challenge. Um, but it helps to bring together both climate change, health, and wealth as, as, obje as objectives. Um, and it can help to inform policies and actions sector by sector, building on that net zero message. I demonstrated that a bit with Aman, how that led to some um, a, a different strategy than would have been taken uh, if we hadn't have considered it from a combustion perspective. Can build these economic measures, and I think this can build a more positive action. You know, we really can take action here that will work. And that really is what I had to present. <laughs> um, and, uh, and with limited time left due to, sorry, uh, my, my computer problems, um, I look forward to questions. Yeah, I don't know. Can you can you hear me? I can hear you. That's good. Oh, I'm so pleased that I haven't been talking to myself for the last twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's great. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, that's 
really nice outline of your ideas. I know it's quite new, um, so thank you for sharing it with us. And I think it's been really quite thought provoking. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, um, do just unmute yourself. You can turn your camera on if you want and uh, fire away. Hello. Yeah, hi. I have one question related to uh, carbon capture and what is your opinion on it and if, if it may serve as a as a part of the transition. Um, so the carbon capture and storage. Um, it can, um, but the, the way I think about it, it's it's there as a transitional measure. Um, you know, my sunny uplands of a post-combustion society would not be based on carbon capture. However, it's a tricky, it's a difficult task and it helps to get in, in getting us there. And the idea of the um, combustion uh, metric, uh, if I go back to that, um, I think it was, it was here somewhere. Yeah. So when you if you consider the energy that's used in a in a process yeah you weight that by the efficiency of conversion and you also weight it by your greenhouse gas emissions now if you've got carbon capture you make that one negative yeah or that comes to zero or or it balances off um and also you know the more you clean uh, the the emissions the, the, the more you can reduce a weighting uh, on, on the impact of your combustion process. Um, and that way you can, you can embrace that into your sort of analysis of, of strategy or um, economic measures and how you, how you weight those, how you consider them. Um, and that carbon capture can come into that and be ab absorbed within that, that system. Thanks. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I personally am not the most um, math, like metrics focused person. However, mm -hmm. I'm studying uh, polar studies and we talk very frequently about this whole idea of the one world kind of you can't take cold from the north without putting heat up there and so in regards to your reduction of combustion and how we're simply just reducing the atmosphere we have do you think i also worked on a, in a regenerative agriculture startup and i guess this also relates to the idea of carbon capture, but the use of natural uh, processes to take carbon and replace it with oxygen through uh, regenerative agriculture. What is your opinion on the uh, inclusion of those kind of policies as a all addition in addition to the other economic incentives that you've mentioned? Yeah, I, obviously we're not going to get to uh, dealing with climate change without really dealing with land use, um, with carbon capture and, and storage through ecosystems and, and, and biosystems. Um, I must say the idea of considering oxygen within that, uh, that cycle is, is an interesting one. Um, and this maybe is a little compatible with that because you know, by combustion, it, you're working from the principle that you need the two together. However, it's not the actual oxygen, you know, we're not burning up our supply of oxygen, we're remaking plenty of that quite fast enough. Um, it's, the, it's the capacity for, for radi radiative forcing, which is the limiting factor. So I'd be inclined to, to, to maintain the focus on, on that. Um, but yeah, I think that how you uh 
how you consider land use change and combustion in there. One thing I have sort of toyed with, haven't really developed further, is the analogy between combustion and respiration. So in, in all your la land transitions and the, the, the rate at which things change, these really are also energy um, uh, transitions. These are energy processes and can be reduced that. Now, I do have to apologize in this. My background is geochemist. I've worked in engineering. I love metrics. I love computer modeling. <laughs> so, you know, I do come at it a little bit like that. I, I'm always looking for, for, for that, that angle because those are things you can get hold of, you can control and you can work with. Um, but I think keeping that that wider philosophy of what you're trying to create is also very important. You know, we've got to work with this living system. Uh, we've got to work out how to create living systems which will, you know, be functional for us. And we need to understand how we in interact with that in our economy. So it's I, very I interesting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, is the combustion of hydrogen in this a positive or a negative thing? Yes, good question. Um, from It really, again, comes down to how you look at your combustion metric. And that, that is definitely a possible um, uh, terminology difficulty because combustion of hydrogen is still combustion it's not such a bad thing and of course from a metric point of view uh, of how well does your process work that is that is considered within this because you're still looking you know if you want a good process how efficiently does it move one lot of energy to the useful bit of energy what are the greenhouse gas emissions well with hydrogen very very low so that suddenly becomes you know just can still be in that same metric. What's the air pollution impact? Again, much, much less, not zero, because you do get nitrous oxides and, and some issues from hydrogen combustion. What's the resource depletion? Um, well, it, it, that, that depends how you made your hydrogen. Um, so there, 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 the, the metric, the framework can embrace that fully. Um, I think you're quite right that the word combustion saying, oh, you know, using hydrogen combustion still could be, you know, a very acceptable thing. The other aspect of hydrogen, obviously, is to use hydrogen in fuel cells um, and to, to, to re re utilize it in that manner, which could be a really, really good thing, um, just as long as we can invent a fuel cell that doesn't require a shed load of platinum and rhodium, because until we can overcome that, we're going to have great difficulty in scaling uh, a fuel cell hydrogen economy, as far as I understand. Quite happy for somebody to correct me on that. Um, but yeah, hydrogen does fit in here. And hydrogen, I, I think, would also be a very important part of being able to balance some of these peaks. So when I showed the, um, uh, the UK uh, energy use over the, the last few years um, and we had our beast from the east, you're going to have a great difficulty in dealing with that sort of sudden energy demand and also some of this interseasonal variation if you can't store energy in a form a bit like fossil fuels, which hydrogen is. It's a little bit more difficult, um, but you know there are ways of, of stabilizing it. So I think it's got a very important part within the overall systems. Thank you. Yeah. Don't know if there are any more questions. I'll just, some people are thinking of a question. I'll just add one other thing on the hydrogen. For some of the very difficult processes like steel uh, production, and petrochemicals, these um, can switch to using a lot more um, hydrogen rather than carbon as the reducing element, um, because combustion is also a, a redox reaction. 
um, and you can use hydrogen rather than carbon to, to, to drive that. It becomes a very important part of the overall balance. There was a question on the uh, chat, I think. So from Kit Baker, I was wondering about the time scale on this transition. Would these methods be fast enough to meet IPCC 1.5 or 2 degrees warming? Yeah. Um, obviously, I haven't done the calculations that would be necessary to answer that question. That is a big, big calculation with lots of scenarios and uh, probably lots of analysis with Sankey diagrams and all sorts of nice tools uh, to work out how you're going, what's going to go where, um, and look at the effect of different scenarios and the consequences in different areas. Um, I think it would be very, very difficult to meet those targets. It's going to be difficult whatever we do, but I think that utilizing this approach will make it easier. I think it, it will simplify it and, and, and help. Um, and I'd like you know, to scale that up, to do some of these calculations and to work out you know, what really is useful. Because what's really going to matter in accelerating that transition is the economic forces which are acting on the people who are making the decisions. Yeah. Um, so the people who are deciding whether to buy a great big new combustion based glass furnace or to get an electric furnace in there, whether, whether to buy their cement um, that's been made again using an electric furnace with some carbon capture or from a coal, coal powered one. Um, and we need, we need to, most of those decisions are going to be based on price uh, and availability. That price is going to depend on the availability of the technology and that the research and development that goes into, the, into these new technologies brings the price down. Now, this has been seen you know, with wind and, and uh, solar panel uh, system costs absolutely plummeting, especially solar, uh, over the years. Um, as more research and development goes into that and as they scale up, so you become more, more and more efficient. You can get that same R&D going into um, the uh, hydrogen uh, electrolysis, you know, to open up the hydrogen market much more. We can see a huge acceleration of this transition. So this is why I want to focus uh, the, those instruments on saying, well, we've got to get rid of that combustion process how do we change the motivation of the people making the decisions? How do we make, make that more effective and focus the economic power? I think there was another one in the chat from... Ah, Field, yes, here we go. Um, ...who asks about the, how does the finiteness of electric vehicle metal content in the earth, i.e. cobalt, lithium or nickel, fit into this transition strategy? I think that's a, it's a very important point. Um, and I, I, was, I did make that a little, especially with regard to platinum and rhod rhodium for the fuel cells. For the others, especially lithium, it's not actually in short supply. There's plenty of it. Um, a lot of this is going to come down to efficient recycling uh, and circular economy um, and to having to process less and less rich ores, all of which needs more and more energy. Um, so, and this is, this is a question, that there is a question here whether we will get over that hump, uh, you know, that potentially there is a problem that the amount of energy that we need in order to do all of this and to make it sustainable requires such a huge infrastructure of wind turbines and solar panels and nuclear power stations and the like um, that we won't be able to build them in time and at sufficiently low cost uh, before the, the, the big problems um, start to happen. Um, so 
you know, this, this is potentially a limitation. However, you would also see in um, electric vehicles, the amount of cobalt and nickel that's required is beginning to reduce as they move to new um, chemical processes. So a lot of these things, you know, there may be ways of avoiding some of these um, element restrictions um, because ultimately we, we really can't make more of those actual elements. Yeah. Anybody else for questions? If not, um, there was one from the sign up form, which, uh, which asks that scientists say that we have already reached a point of no return in terms of the minor effects of global warming. Do you think then that we should spend more time on trying to adapt to the changes instead? Um, the two of those very, very much go hand in hand. Um, for the Amman spatial strategy that I was preparing, I, I should explain that's a very large project covering many, many things. And I was responsible for the climate change part of it. And that covers mitigation and adaptation. And adaptation is obviously vitally important, um, you know, to work out you know, what are going to be the hazards that we'll face, where are we vulnerable to them? What can we do to reduce those hazards? Um, and how do we, you know, how do we how, how do how do we adapt? Um, it's just that, in a way, that's just another complete talk. It's a different it's a different area. Um, I'd love to say yes, combustion transition is going to sort that as well. It's a brilliant. It, it doesn't. It, it it's not so big on that side. Yeah, that's a that's a different uh, aspect of the problem, which has to be tackled. You know, in a different way, and is very much about you know, how we use our land, where we position ourselves, how, how we retreat, how we manage our, our urban environment. Also on adaption, I think the, the embracing of living, you know, less intensively um, with more biodiversity around us, you know, more greenery in our cities, absorbing the heat, absorbing rainfall and, and flood, using natural capital management. These are all very, very um, important aspects of it. And these have all sorts of implications for um, the absorbing of uh, carbon dioxide as well on, on, on mitigation. So I think that there, there are crossovers. Uh, and I think they're more to do with how we use land, how we come to nature-based solutions, how we you know, create a more sustainable world. Um, and and we are going to have to change, you know, obviously very, very much. Um, and, uh, you know, I think by the end of this century or so, yes, things are going to get quite, quite dramatically different. I just hope that we can manage to make good headway on this transition uh, and moving to a, a you know, a, a more sustainable system before we get totally distracted by all the disasters that, that may be happening. Thank you for, for answering that. Hmm. Um, any more any more questions from the from the audience? Okay, it seems not. Um, in that case, yeah. thank you very much, um, Professor Spooner, for, for joining us and for sharing your, your work with us. Um, certainly very, very relevant, of course, and uh, interesting to see this new kind of perspective on, on this uh, off-tackled problem. Um, so yes, thank you once again for, for sharing the evening with us and, and the work. Um, I hope everyone still on the call will will join me in in thanking him. Um.
So yes, thanks once again. A recording for this will be made available hopefully tomorrow um, at some stage. Um, and that will be on our YouTube channel and we'll send the link out in case you want to catch up and examine uh, the talk in, in, in more detail. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you all for coming and thanks once again, Professor, for, for joining us. Well, thank you all very much. And um, if you do have other questions, very happy for the, you to pass those through to me um, and to discuss further. So after, after the meeting, thank you. And thank you very much, Krishna, and to all the organizers uh, of, of the meeting.